Well, good morning, Meadowbrook. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see you. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are so glad that you are with us this morning. So this is a picture uh, of a guy named Andrew Vanderbile. Uh, he was known to many as Brother Andrew. He was a, a Dutch missionary uh, through the, most of the 20th century and kind of was most notable for the organization he started called Open Door, Open Doors, which is a missionary organization that supports the persecuted church and persecuted tr- Christians all across the globe. And he was most notable for, for the way that he engaged in mission work early on in his career. And what he did was he smuggled Bibles into communist countries during the Cold War. So he would hide Bibles in his vehicles and drive them across. And, and, and what he's most noted for as well, and the way that he did that, was his life of faith. There's a book that was written about him, a biography called God's Smuggler, uh, because of the work he did smuggling Bibles into communist countries. And the, the, the book details the story of his call to the ministry as well as the development of his faith. And, and the way that he, he lived by faith, in one way, when it came to smuggling Bibles, was he had this light blue VW Beetle. And he would drive this beetle right into communist countries, and he would hide Bibles in his car, sometimes just in boxes in the trunk, sometimes underneath the seat. And whenever you would cross into another country, your car would be searched. But he never once was caught, never once found out for smuggling Bibles. And a lot of his faith development happened while he was in missionary training school. As most students or they're, they're broke, right? He, he was broke as a missionary student and, and broke beyond broke, right? You, you read the stories of, of what he had and what he didn't have and how he survived, and he, he just learned to live on faith, each semester praying that God would provide the resources he needed for the next semester to stay in school. And, and there's one story in his biography where he has to renew his visa. He, he's a, he was a he was from the Netherlands doing his missionary training in England, and so he had to have a visa renewed every year. And it was a few days before his paperwork was due. He had this application that he filled out. He had to send it in, and he didn't even have the money for postage to send his application in, and so he just started to pray. He said one day he was out like just looking on the ground for money. It was a shilling, right? So like a coin, not, not a ton of money. But again, he was broke beyond broke. And he's looking on the ground for money. He couldn't find any. He goes back to his dorm. It's now the day before his, the postmark is supposed to be due. And he gets this knock on his, his dorm. Like he, he just gets a random visitor. And it's this guy named Richard. And Richard is somebody he's befriended because he would go on these prayer walks through a neighboring neighborhood that was a more low-income neighborhood, and he would just talk to people as he's on his prayer walks. And Richard was this homeless guy that he met, and every once in a while, Richard would show up at his dorm asking for something. And on this day, Richard was hoping to ask for something that would maybe help him. And, you know, Andrew just starts talking to him and says, hey, I don't have anything. But during the conversation, he, he looks on the ground and there's this like shiny reflection and he notices it's a shilling. It's a coin on the ground. And so inconspicuously as he's talking to Richard, he kind of puts his foot <laughs> on the coin and slides it to him by his side and also inconspicuously bends down, picks up the coin and puts it in his pocket and keeps this conversation with Richard going. And then he said, as soon as the coin was in his pocket, God was all over him, telling him to give that coin to Richard. And he's like, but God, like, I, I got to stay in school. You, you want me to be here because I'm, I'm studying and I'm training to do mission work. Don't, don't you want me to stay in school? If I don't get my visa renewed, I'll get kicked out of the country. And besides, if I give it to this guy, he's just going to blow it on something useless. He's not really going to help himself with it. But he said, God was just all over over him in that conversation and wanting to operate in a place of faith, wanting to be obedient to what God was calling him to, he reached into his pocket and he said, all right, Richard, this is the only, this is it. This is all I've got. I'm going to give it to you. And Richard's eyes just blew open and he grabbed the coin and walked away just happy as can be. And Andrew said he went back inside just saying, okay, I'm going to trust that God will somehow provide what I need to pay my postage to stay in school. And sure enough, later that afternoon, the mailman came, and there was a letter from a friend 
And he said as soon as he saw the name on that letter, he knew there was going to be money in that envelope. And there was way more that he needed to pay for the postage, to send in his visa application, to stay in school and get all these other things. And, and throughout this, his, his biography, there's story after story after story of the way that God provided for him in the way that God invited him into a life of faith to trust that all of his daily needs would be met. And I'm going to guess for those of us who are here this morning, who are really seeking to follow Jesus diligently and faithfully, you would say, I want a faith like that, right? Like, I actually want to live in a way where I trust God that He will meet my needs. That I, at times, want to step out and do courageous things, knowing that God will meet me in that step of faith, and He will encourage me and provide everything that I need. But also, if you're anything like me, you probably also know that there's this fear that lives inside that sometimes creates a barrier to you actually living by faith. And so the question for us this morning is how do you overcome fear that can compromise your faith? When you have this desire to live in a very bold and courageous way when it comes to your faith, but you know at the same time you have this fear within you that can compromise it, how do you overcome your fear? How is it that you get beyond it? Well, our passage today speaks to that question and gives us a great answer. And this is how our passage begins. This is Matthew 14, starting in verse 22. It says, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Now, if you were to back up to the beginning of, of Matthew 15, excuse me, 14, Jesus receives word that a good friend and family member of his has passed away. And so at the beginning of chapter 14, Jesus tries to get alone. He's on one side of the Sea of Galilee. He goes to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, trying to go to a solitary place, it says, probably wanting to be alone to grieve. But as soon as he gets to the other side, there's this massive crowd of people waiting for him. So even in a place of grief, as Jesus steps out of this boat, he spends an entire day ministering to this massive crowd of thousands and thousands of people. He's teaching them about the kingdom. He's healing all the sick in that community. He's feeding them even. And so here, the day of unexpected ministry, right, because he was trying to get alone, the day of unexpected ministry is finished, and he sends the disciples to get back in the boat, to go back to the other side of the lake where they came from, and he dismisses the crowd. Now he can finally be alone. And so in the middle of verse 23, Jesus dismisses the crowd, sends the disciples on his way, and then you have a quick scene change, because it then says, later that night, so they've sent the, Jesus has sent the disciples out. They're now on the boat, and we fast forward a couple hours. Later that night, he, being Jesus, was alone praying, verse 24, and the boat with the disciples was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So Jesus stays behind to pray, and what we see in this moment is that following Jesus sometimes includes struggles. I don't know if you're here this morning and you're in a place where you would say, I'm struggling. Maybe it's a relational struggle, a parenting struggle, marital struggle, financial struggle. But sometimes following Jesus includes struggles. And we see that in this moment with the disciples in two ways. One, we're told that they're traveling through the night. And there's a, there's a pretty good chance that at this point in the story, the disciples are dead tired. It's the middle of the night. They've been up 
all day. If you were to go to the beginning of that day, they left wherever they were on one side of the Sea of Galilee. They're with Jesus. They're traveling to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And now before the day is over, they're traveling back. That's probably five or six miles. That's a total of a 10 to 12 mile trip. And in the middle of those two trips, they spend an entire day ministering to a crowd of thousands of people. Unexpectedly, they thought they were going to go with Jesus to be alone. And they're just working non-stop. And on the way back, it's not as though they would have caught the local ferry or hired a boat. They are rowing themselves from one side to the other. In the second part of their struggle we see is that they are fighting the wind and the waves the entire time. This isn't a leisure paddle across the pond. This is a lot of physical exertion and work. And what's interesting about this moment is that Jesus sends them into the struggle. He sends them on their way into it. And so, if you are here this morning and you do find yourself in a moment of struggle, my encouragement to you is that it could be that this is a great opportunity for growth, right? Because when we have the right mindset and perspective about our struggle, we know that on the other side can come growth. Jesus knows that too. So Jesus sometimes sends us into seasons of struggle, knowing that it's a great opportunity for growth. And anybody who's raised kids and seen a child try and learn a new skill or develop a new habit or try and take on something new, there's this moment of just difficulty. And as a parent, sometimes you say to your kid, I'm just going to let them work on it and struggle with it because it's through the struggle they learn things and there's actually growth that can come out of it. Sometimes when we hit struggles in life, we think either this is God punishing me for something, or we have this expectation that when I start following Jesus, it will alleviate all my struggles. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And you're like, yes, I want that in my life. But as soon as I hit a struggle, it's like, whoa, I didn't sign up for this. I thought Jesus was going to take all my struggles away. But sometimes Jesus allows us to go into and through seasons of struggle because he knows that on the other side, there's great growth to be had. And so for the disciples in this moment, not only are they rowing into the night, we also read that it actually is a trip that happens through the night because verse 25 starts shortly before dawn. Now again, Early the next morning, or the previous morning, they would have been up rowing across the Sea of Galilee. They're on their way back. It's been almost a full 24 hours, and they've been going, going, going. And then, when the sun starts to rise, this is what they see. Verse 25, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. I like to imagine it this way. I mean, I don't know how they're rowing. Like, are they paddling like this? Are they rowing like this? I, but I imagine they're rowing like this. So they're looking in the direction they've just come from, and there's some guy in the back of the boat. And remember, they're pushing against the waves, so the boat is rocking all over the place. It's early in the morning, so there could be haze and fog all across the lake. And if you've ever been on a car ride and you've had to drive through the night, you know that when the sun comes up in the morning, your eyes just start to burn like crazy. And then the wind whipping across the lake doesn't help, and their eyes are probably all dried out. And so there's some guy in the back of the boat. He's rowing, and the boat's all over the place. And as he's looking from one side to the next, just trying to figure out where they're going, he looks back and he has to do a double take, and he's like, what in the world is that? Like, not expecting anybody to be coming towards him. And I would imagine he stops and everybody else is like, keep rowing, keep rowing. He's like, but look at that. And they're all losing their mind, and somebody goes, it's a ghost. And they're terrified. 
I, anybody here ever seen somebody walk on water before? Like, I would think that person is possessed if they were doing that, right? And so Jesus, coming to them in verse 27, says this. But immediately Jesus said to them, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. They're terrified, never having seen anything like this before in their mind. And Jesus does two things in this moment. One, Jesus is coming to the disciples, right? In Mark's gospel, it says that Jesus sees them struggling. He's up on the mountainside. It says he sees them struggling. Like Jesus could have stayed at a distance. And sometimes when we go through seasons of struggle, it feels as though he is, right? Sometimes as we work through hard situations, it can feel like God is distant. He's removed. He doesn't understand what I'm going through. But in Mark's version of this story, it says, no, no Jesus sees them. Like he knows he knows when we're in seasons of struggle, and he comes near to us. Like, he could have met the disciples on the other side of the lake. He'd just been standing there when they land, like, hey, guys, what took you so long? How was the trip? Right? But he comes to them in their struggle. And if you're in a season of struggle, take heart, take courage, because Jesus is near. It, it might be hard to see him, as apparently it is for the disciples in this moment. But he's close at hand. And the other thing that Jesus does in this moment is he reveals himself to the disciples. He says, it is I. Now notice, he doesn't say his name. He doesn't say, it's me, Jesus, I've come near. He says, it is I. But the disciples seem to know right away that it's Jesus. Because in the very next verse, in verse 28, Peter's next words to him is, Lord, if it's you. Lord, Jesus just says, it is I. Peter's response is, Lord, if it's you. He recognizes that it's Jesus. And it immediately gives him confidence. He says, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Now, even though he believes that it's Jesus out on the water, he's still looking for confirmation. Like, if it is you, tell me to do this, which raises a question. If they are recognizing that it's Jesus, what is it that they're recognizing but again, there's probably some measure in which it's hard to see. Otherwise, they wouldn't need confirmation. But what is it that they recognize that gives them some indication this is probably Jesus? I believe, I wonder and believe, maybe it's his voice. It's hard to see him in that moment. Maybe with the wind and the waves, maybe fog on the morning. Like, but they recognize, they, they hear, it is I. And they recognize the tone of his voice and say, I've heard that before. And so Jesus says to Peter, come, verse 29. Peter says, hey, if it's you, Lord, tell me to come on the water. And he says, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat. And I know we've probably, if we've grown up in church, heard this story, read this story, been told this story. But let's just take a moment and contemplate, like, how amazing this is. Amazing it is. One, that Jesus is walking on water. And then you read, Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. Growing up in New Hampshire, I uh, worked at a summer camp for many summers right on a lake, have spent hundreds and hundreds of hours out on the water, pulling kids on tubes. I was a lifeguard, was a boat driver, teaching people to ski. I've been on the back of a boat hundreds of times. Never once have I sat on the side of a boat and thought to myself, oh, there's a tube out in the water. I'm just going to go walk to it and hop in it. I mean, 
every time you sit on the edge of the boat and you get in the water, you're expecting to go in and down, right? And I don't know for Peter what he's feeling like in this moment. Now, it's interesting because he initiates this, right? Peter's the one who says, tell me to do this. And he's really believing that it's God because it could be anybody out on that and be like, hey, watch this. I'm going to tell this guy to come and I'm not really Jesus. Like it could have been just some other boat. But he has this confidence that this is Jesus. He's doing something I've never seen anybody do before. And I'm going to have the audacity to do the same myself. See, following Jesus sometimes involves struggle. But also it requires in that struggle taking a step of faith. Trusting that Jesus is near. Trusting that he is speaking to us in our struggle. Trusting that he is going to provide for us what we need to do the things that we never thought we could do. As we come to the end of this five-week series that we're calling Forward, uh, we're inviting you as a congregation to take a step of faith. Over the last four weeks, we've been putting forward this vision of what we believe God is calling us to do in this next season of ministry, of who he's calling us to be. We've seen exciting growth. We've seen so many new people come. We believe that God is rooting us in this community for decades to come to, to have and develop a lasting gospel legacy right here in East Tosa. And as we think about the future we believe one of the things that we need to do as a church is rethink our space, rework our space so that it can accommodate the church that we are becoming. And so over the last few weeks, we've been talking about this vision. We've been talking about these renovations, talking about how we want to be a church that's a hospital and a home for people in this community. And so today is the day where we're asking you to take a step of faith, to take a step and help support the work that we are doing. And I've got to believe that for many of us, as we have worked through these last five weeks, there's probably been some measure of struggle as you think about what is the Lord calling me to do? How is he calling me to engage? How is he calling me to fund what Meadowbrook is doing? But my hope is that in the midst of that struggle, you have heard from God in the same way that the disciples hear Jesus out on the water that you have heard from the Lord, and that you too are willing to take a step of faith and move towards Him and what He's calling us to do. And so today is the day that we step into this new season of ministry. And what it takes to take a step of faith is courage. When you're in a season of struggle, When Jesus is inviting you into something scary, maybe even chaotic, it takes courage to take that step of faith. Now, in Peter's case, sometimes Peter gets a bad rap, right? Like, he he can be viewed as kind of like brash, doesn't always think things through. Sometimes he's impulsive. He puts his foot in his mouth. Near the end of Jesus' life, he says, Jesus, I will never deny you. I will go to the cross with you. That very same night before the evening is over, he denies Jesus three times. Sometimes Peter gets a bad rap. There's one time where Jesus says, like, get behind me, Satan, talking to Peter, right? But even though sometimes he gets a bad rap, Peter also has courage. Jesus says, Take courage. Come out on the water. And Peter takes courage and goes out on the water. Now, that's not to say Peter isn't afraid in this moment. That's not to say Peter steps out and he's 100% sure that he's not going to sink to the bottom. Because courage isn't the absence of fear. Courage is walking into the thing that terrifies you knowing that it's not going to be easy. Because following Jesus involves struggle. Following Jesus requires a step of faith. And in that, following Jesus can also be scary because it stretches us outside our comfort zone. And the interesting thing about this story is fear is all over the story. The words fear, afraid, and terrified are used four times in this story. And at this moment, as Peter steps out 
of the boat into the water. As he starts to walk across the water, fear rises again. Verse 30. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. Now notice what causes fear to overtake Peter. Did you catch that? Did you catch where he's looking? What does it say he sees? The wind. Now, I don't know about you, I've never seen the wind before. Like, from what I understand, you can't see wind. Like, you can see the effects of the wind, but you don't actually see the wind. So what does it mean when it says Peter sees the wind? It probably means he sees the effects of the wind. He's seeing the waves that it's causing, which means he's looking down, implying where is he not looking? At Jesus. He starts to look at his circumstances. He starts to look at what's around him. He takes his eyes off Jesus, and he begins to sink. But again, fortunately for Peter, Jesus has come to them. Jesus is nearby, and this is what happens in verse 31. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? What's captured in this moment is that our faith stays strong when we fix our eyes on Jesus. When we're in moments of struggle, when we're wanting to take a step of faith, when it even seems scary and we fix our eyes on Jesus, our faith remains strong. But we can do those things. We can take that step even when it seems overwhelming if we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. So uh, over the course of this last month, as, as we've been working through this series and we've been putting in front of you the opportunity to make a financial commitment to this next season of ministry, now, you know, I've mentioned before that, that God is leading our family to make a commitment as well. And, and it's been a stretch of faith. It, it seems scary for us at times. And we had this moment on, on Monday night where I found myself thinking like, maybe I should pull back on what I said I was going to do. We were going to bed on Monday night. So at 1030 we were getting, just winding down, getting in bed, and Becky's phone dinged, right? It was ding, and so she's got this notification. She opens it up. It's an email, and it says that there was a $200 charge on her business account that she didn't make. Every time her card, her business card gets run, she gets an email notification. She scrolls down a little bit further and sees that there was another charge for some $550 made just a few minutes before that $200 charge. And I'm like, you got to call somebody, like right away, call the bank. It's 1030 at night on Monday. She gets somebody at customer service, and it says, you need to talk to the fraud department. I'll transfer you. Well, the fraud department is not open at 1030 on a Monday night. And they're like, okay, you'll have to call back tomorrow. So we go to bed that night. I'm like, that's a lot of money already. And we wake up the next morning to another email of another $550 charge that went through in the middle of the night. And I'm starting to get nervous. I'm starting to get anxious. I'm like, that's already $1,200 right there. And before the morning will finish, another charge of over $1,000 tried to go through. And so I found myself thinking like, you know, the impulse in me is, is safety. The impulse in me is like, we need to have enough and more than enough, so in case something like that happens, we're going to be okay. Now, now, fortunately, everything got reversed, everything got stopped, it's fine. But we have these moments when we take our eyes off Jesus and we look at our circumstances, it can be scary and overwhelming, and we can find ourselves recoiling back rather than saying, no, we, we're still going to step forward because we're going to have faith and confidence that Jesus will give us everything we need every step of the way. And the call for this, in this passage is for us to keep our eyes fixed on him because he's only an outstretched arm away from providing everything we need. And it says in verse 32, when they climbed back in the boat, the wind, wide down, wind died down. And then those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, truly you are the son of God. See, when we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, we are able to see him for who he truly is, the Son of God, the one sent from God who holds all things together by his powerful word, the one for whom all things were created. All things are him. Everything belongs to him. 
And therefore, we are simply stewards of what He has entrusted to us, and He has promised to give us everything we need. And here's why I love this passage. I love the way that it ends. Because you go into verse 34, it says, When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. And people brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. Five weeks ago when we started this series, we looked at a story of Andrew bringing his brother Peter in this story to Jesus and how that one little interaction changed the course of Peter's life forever. And then we're ending with this moment of a reminder that when Jesus shows up, people want to bring other people to him because they know that he can change their life. We want to be a church that is all about helping people come to Jesus. We want to be a church that's all about bringing people to Jesus because we know that it is Jesus and Jesus alone who has the power to transform and change someone's life. And along the way, sometimes we struggle, sometimes we have to take steps of faith, and sometimes that's scary. But we believe that in those places, in those moments, He provides us everything that we need to become the people He's calling us to be. Now, as we move through this series, we've been showing videos each week of of couples and families who have been impacted by our church and how they're processing this next step in moving forward into this new ministry season. So we wanted to share one more with you. We're going to introduce you to, to Brian and Tirza. So go ahead and take a look at the screen. My name's Brian. This is my wife, Tirza. We've been coming to Meadowbrook for probably about two years at this point. Uh, we have two kids, Esther, who's two years old, and Timothy, who's three months old. I was talking with a, a friend of mine, and he mentioned uh, you should come check it out. And so we did. And pretty much the first day, we were just you know, frankly, like overjoyed by it and uh, really wanted to come back. Last year, I was struggling with being able to have that accountability to actually like read and study scripture. Tapestries, it's so wonderful. They're going through actual books of the Bible, wanting to know the context, wanting like having a love for God's word. I think there's about 70 women in the Bible study and they show up every week. And that meant so much to me being able to talk with women how do I apply that to my life and how are they applying it to their lives and that sort of community in God's word was so very necessary to me in that season of life men's group has been really impactful for me just uh, the ability you know to have that accountability and the thing that strengthened my faith personally is seeing God move in the lives of others that type of regular interaction with God-fearing men is I think pretty rare and it's been extremely helpful to me. One of the things that stands out to me about Meadowbrook is the children's ministry and the youth ministry. You have 13 year olds who actually like look at you in the face and talk to you and carry a conversation and they delight in talking about God. Uh, I know that the initiative is at least uh, partially uh, revolving around the philosophy of trying to equip uh, Meadowbrook as a community to serve and uh, act missionally toward the community um, locally but then also abroad and uh, that starts with in, inside these walls and the children that are being raised up here and I know that a lot of consideration has been given to the, the youth ministry and, and children's ministry. The youth is passionate about their faith and they're actually inspiring our children to worship God. Growing up my family had periods of time where there wasn't much like even to buy groceries and my dad that never halted his generosity he was always still giving god has given so graciously to us and it's pretty clear if you if you come to faith and you believe what the bible says that it's not really ours to begin with like we're we're all stewards and we get to use what god has provided as a blessing um but It's only because of him that we have what we have, so. You're giving when it hurts a little bit, or it hurts a lot. (laughs) That's also an opportunity to see God do incredible things. Everything that we've sort of witnessed with the different ministries and how they're serving people has sort of proven over time that Meadowbrook is 
uh, a place that loves the Lord and a community that is not only seeking to increase their own faith, but to share that faith. It's not just about singing a few songs on Sunday. It's about uh, a family that's growing together in Christ and then seeking to um, love those around them in the world. Um, I, one thing that was really stirring to me when the first Sunday that we came, we looked around and we were instantly met with love. We just saw like people of different backgrounds and different um, age ranges and uh, abilities just caring for one another mm -hmm. and it was a bit jarring because I've I've come from a few different churches and I never saw that but I almost didn't know what I was missing until I actually witnessed it being done people just being the hands and feet of Jesus what Meadowbrook has they've been trustworthy with what they've been given already and so with what this initiative what this project is I know and I have uh, well, I have strong belief that they're going to be trustworthy um, still and that God's going to be able to do incredible things with what what's planned here. He can prompt us and he can lead us and all that we have to do is just give generously out of out of faith and out of the kindness of our heart. I think that's something that stands out to me also is like, do I want to be a part of something God's doing? Or do I want that to be something other people get to do? Because God's will is going to be accomplished, but what role do I have to play in that? I love what Tirza says at the end is that do, do I want to be a part of what God is doing? Do, do I want to partner with Him and participate with Him and actually follow through with what He's doing in our lives? And, and what we're saying as a church is we're wanting to move forward, believing that God is leading us into a season of ministry where we want to move forward for the sake of community. We want to develop our, our facility here in a way that just nurtures community and creates this place to be a hospital and a home for people. We want to move, or move forward for the sake of the next generation where all the kids that we have in the lower level will be raised up and sent out to be faithful followers of Jesus. And we want to move out into the world, continue to be a beacon of hope and light for this community. And we believe that as we do this, our, our first step forward is to think about our space and to renovate our space. And so hopefully through the last couple of weeks, you've seen the pictures, you've looked at the booklet, you've been able to get all your questions answered, and you're at a place where you're like, yes, I'm, I'm ready to take this step forward. I'm ready to move forward and make a commitment. And so you'll find in the back of your, your seat there, there's, there's commitment cards. And I know many people have come in, are having them all filled out. And our, our invitation to you in this moment, if you're ready to turn it in, in just a moment, we're going to have ushers pass baskets. You can just drop it in. But if you're also at a place where you're like, I need a little bit more time to process that, that's okay. You can take this home and continue to pray through it. You know, there's a space on here that, that says the first line in the little equation is like, what do I normally give? Maybe you're in a place where you've never given to a church or you've never given to Meadowbrook Church, and that's okay. And this is a great opportunity to take that step and say, what, what could God do with my financial commitment? How, how might God multiply that? And what might God do in my own life if I take a step of faith to say, Lord, I want to participate with all that I have, my time, my energy, and my resources? So if you have any questions about how to fill this out, you can talk to myself, you could talk to Chris. We'd love to walk you through it. But we're looking for you today to, to make a commitment for the next two years to help us move forward, to reach this community in a way that has the potential to change the lives of people in our community. So we're going to give you just a minute to pray over this one more time. Maybe it's a prayer of just like final commitment saying, Lord, I'm, I'm giving this to you as an act of worship. Maybe it's a moment of prayer to say, Lord, how are you inviting me into this? What, what fear is holding me back and how might I fix my eyes on you? And then in just a minute, I'm going to come up one more time. I'm going to pray over the offering and then the ushers will pass the baskets.
So Lord, we, we pray over all of these commitments this morning. We recognize that the life we have is from you, and it's also for you. And we are called to, to give back what you have entrusted to us, to advance your kingdom, to partner with you, and to be faithful in the ways that you might lead us forward. And so, Lord, may we live open-handedly with all that we have in life. And may we trust that as we take this step of faith, you are a God who is faithful and will provide everything we need. Amen.